you guys doing? Good. Good. Okay. Excellent. Excellent. We were, we were going to talk about tiny bubbles <laughs> this week. That's right. I, I wanted to kind of set that up a little bit, and I have a little piece of uh, presentation that I thought might be helpful to set that up as, as why we want to go toward bubble management uh, uh, and uh, in this in this period. And so, gosh, uh, I have I have some stuff. I, I, why don't I try to share my screen here? Okay. And we can see where we are and see what makes sense. We'll get through as much of it as we can. So it's, let's see here. <clears throat> now I haven't shown a lot of these slides to anybody, so I, I'll need to have your help uh, in, um, and make, making sure they're comprehensible. We'll do our best. Okay, so the first one. Oh, it, <laughs> okay. <laughs> I've suppressed the fourth and fifth dimensions of the slide and only have three. <laughs> so oh. hopefully this is gonna be something that's understandable. One of the things that's happening right now is that people are starting <laughs> to understand that efficacy and, and effectiveness are not quite the same thing. What we did in our mm. clinical trials is we select clinical endpoints uh, and so we're looking at vaccines and we're trying to decide how fast we're going to reach herd immunity, how effective these will actually be in the real world. And so we are mixing real world analysis with, uh, with clinical trial results and trying to understand what the overall impact of this vaccine is going to be. And when we did our clinical trials, um, we have a full circle around disease pathology. We know for sure because of our clinical endpoints that we selected that well, we're, we're at least pretty sure that Moderna and Pfizer, for almost everybody who takes it, you will have almost no serious disease. And we're talking about 90 plus percent effectiveness. And in the case of Moderna, 100 percent effectiveness. In the case of Pfizer, they had one questionable uh, uh, out, out of, out of, out of uh, serious, serious uh, disease uh, out of that was, uh, uh, let's see, 17,000 people tested. So mm. one out of 17,000. Not too bad. <clears throat> You know, so uh, we know that this is these these drugs are very efficacious in our clinical trial work. And on the other hand, what we're not, what we didn't test for, and what we and, and remember the way we tested that, right? We kind of injected some people with the vaccine, some people with a fake vaccine with just salt water, and then we let them go out and we get we let them see what the infectivity rate was, and we got results and that showed, gosh, the infectivity rate, the disease, the actual people catching the disease, maybe people raise their hand, oh, I feel sick, they would get tested, sure enough, they had the disease. That's, we knew for sure that we re reduced the disease that much. What we weren't sure about are two other factors that are really important for overall efficaciousness of the vaccine. The first one is, did we reduce the transmission? Did our, our is, is it, if, we, if we vaccinate everyone, will it stop spreading? Or will we just reduce the amount of disease we've got, you know, everyone will have colds and sniffles, but they won't get, you know, super sick and die. Uh, now that's a good outcome, but it's not the same thing as having lots and lots of disease around, lots and lots of colds and sniffles. And every once in a while, if you have a large enough gene pool, we know that we can get variants that may not be colds and sniffles. It may actually be worse, may kill us faster. Uh, Cause right now we've already got 500,000 dead. That's a sad, sad uh, day today. We're gonna hit 500,000, I think. So the other bit, so that, that, that's the one thing we don't, aren't sure about. And the other thing we're not sure about is whether we can prevent reinfection. So after a small period of time, are you gonna be susceptible again? And those are, the two, those are two really important factors. They're actually more important than actually reducing disease, if you think about it, whether we reduce spread and whether we reduce reinfection. Because if you're constantly getting reinfected, you're constantly sick. It really you know, puts a drain on the economy, causes you to have you know, significant, you wanna wear your mask all the time, you're gonna to have to test it all the time. It's not gonna, we're not gonna be able to return to normalcy if we can't reduce transmission, can't reduce reinfection. Uh, it'll be better, we'll live uh, through a, uh, a probably through a through a through a disease, but we won't we won't necessarily reduce its prevalence in our in our communities or the way we're having to deal with it, which is with lots of masking and interference and distancing and not being able to visit our families. So, um, what will happen if we only have if we only have something that's good for efficacy? And the uh, I'm sorry for for the, the disease. And the answer in real world is what happens is you start to dilute the virus. So remember how the Spanish flu killed off so many people, uh, and eventually it got incorporated into the flu. It got slowly but surely was endemic. And today we can still find pieces of the Spanish flu around in in, in the in the flu uh, in the flu uh, what the the, the 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 flu genetic code, but it's not killing us off. 
we're just it just sort of got incorporated. And that's what happens here. If we get something that right, basically if all we can do is reduce the disease, what happens is that slowly but surely we vaccinate everybody who's vulnerable, right? We, uh, all of us older guys get vaccinated and, and the disease moves from those communities to the young people who don't actually get that sick, right? And so slowly but surely you start to you start to get to what they call an endemic disease. So it's, it's, it's around, but it's not as impactful as it initially was. And there, what we do for those kind of diseases is we create childhood universal vaccines, you know, like mm -hmm. we have for MMR and so on. And then we per, you know, give people boosters if we have a big outbreak or have trouble challenges with that, uh, if it slowly wanes. Now, so that, that's, that's where we are for sure right now. We are at, on that track, right? But the problem is that takes five years. You know, it's going to take us a few years to loot this this thing down. Um, uh, uh, if we if we that that's that those are a lot of assumptions there. It could, between, it could take between one and twenty years to do that. Uh, but given what we think the infectivity rate and the death rates are, we think it's going to be about a five year process. So. Uh, the other big so that so what happens if we have something that for sure reduces transmission? I don't know if you guys saw, but there was a there was a researcher in Israel that twittered that tweeted the results of a clinical trial. Uh, and it, the problem was it wasn't a clinical trial; it was a real world trial in one of the largest hospitals in uh, in Israel. And that they, they, he claimed that they had reduced transmission spread by eighty nine percent. Now that's remarkable. Uh, the problem is, unfortunately, the way you look at transmission spread uh, is you, you test the different cohorts, vaccinated and un unvaccinated. And in Israel, it turned out, sadly, that everyone who wasn't vaccinated had to get tested a lot more often. Every time you went into a building, every time you went on, 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 you know, on a trip, every time you, you felt a little bit sick, you'd get tested. Uh, versus the guys who had the vaccine, they say, oh, you, you, you know, please enter, you know, please enter, you can fly anywhere you want, and no, not enough testing. So what happened was, of course, you super tested the guys who didn't have the vaccine, didn't test the guys who did that. So we could have missed a lot of that, uh, a lot of that. We know, we, we're pretty sure from the clinical trials that we're going to get 50%. 90% probably overstates the case. So if we get 50% and we actually reduce the transmission, that's exciting. And we think that's going to be enough to actually cause herd immunity faster, much faster than if we only have something that, that reduces the disease pathology and causes an endemic virus. Here, we really have to monitor what the prevalence is. We have, really have to uh, monitor community vaccination levels. We really have to understand community spread levels a lot better than we do today. We're not testing nearly enough to understand that very well. So the problem with this is we're not, we don't really know where we are. And we probably can't find out where we are until we do some pretty uh, good trials. And right now, the best trials that are being conducted uh, that have just been allowed in England uh, are, te are what they call challenge trials. They're actually going to inject people uh, and not inject people. And then they're going to expose them to the virus, to various levels of the virus. And they're going to try to figure out exactly how much virus is required for each kind of phenotype, which uh, you know, these are going to be young, 18 year olds, 30 year olds. They're going to be monitored constantly. Uh, and every time they get a, you know, they'll, they'll, they'll try to give them a little bit of virus, a little bit more virus, a little bit more virus, a little more virus, and they're going to try to see whether the people who've been vaccinated need more or less virus to actually transmit the disease. Now, that's a very sophisticated study. It's also, in mm. my opinion, pretty unethical because we, you know, sadly, I think there's going to be a lot of people who get this disease and then have long-term effects, even though they're young. Uh, so I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, <clears throat> I'm, I'm happy that the epidemiologists were able to convince the uh, you know, the, 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 the authorities, uh, but I, I wouldn't have advised them to allow that kind of a trial to occur. And I'm worried about the people who are participating. So mm. if you get invited to that kind of trial, Mike, don't, don't do it. <laughs> no problem. I still haven't even got my first That's vaccine right. yet. Right. Hint, hint out there, health department. Hey, you know, so uh, I've signed yeah. up for everything and I can't even, uh, you know, take oh. one out. So. You know, I, I, I last night I, I I ordered a little bit of lacy cookies. You know, I like the lacy cookies, and I ordered them up, and I can track my lacy cookies from basically the point of manufacture all the way to my doorstep <laughs> in real time. And I, <laughs> I'm sitting here on that vaccine stuff, that are life saving vaccines, and I have no idea what's going. On. And I, and I have access to a lot of stuff that I, you can look at that and go, "You're kidding me! You're getting a five week site. You know, you don't know what's going on with a vaccine from." point A to point B for five days, six days. You know, you have no idea where it is, what its control levels are. I, 
it's oh, just geez. incredible to me the priorities we've created. But anyway, that's another story. Uh, I'm looking forward to the getting. I, 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 in, in, in about three hours, I'll get my lacy cookies. <laughs> Vaccines, I have no idea. But you'd rather have the shot. Yes, right. Oh, okay. yeah, I'd rather have the shot of it. So well, the maybe they can figure out some way of putting the vaccine in the cookies. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> and then they have a nice edible thing going. Yeah, it'll be uh, like the, uh, the target, polio, right? yeah, like the polio yeah. sugar cube. I remember that. Yeah, yeah. well, yeah, I remember cube, that. I remember that. Yeah. yeah. Well, it turns out that for mucosal for mucosal diseases like this one, it's better to you know uh, give yourself a snort of something or inhale something than it is actually to inject. We're gonna, and we're slowly getting going to get those uh, kind of vaccines available mostly for lesser developed countries i think because they have a better they have a better uh, way of um of uh, of, 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 of uh, transporting them yeah so, easier to store too right yeah much easier to store easier yeah. to inject uh, you know now the challenges between you and me is that you know inhalation kinds of uh of modes of of, of administration are very hard to control you know how much is a sniff how how open are your lungs uh, how how much of a squirt do you need Luckily, we've got flu vaccines that are doing this already. Flu mist and others from Abbott, uh, and they, 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 so we've got this down pretty well. But it takes a long time to sort of dial that in. So that's why it's going to take a little longer. Anyway, the last issue we've got is, is the reinfection prevention, right? And this is all you hear about in these variants. And I don't know if you've heard about all these variants. We talked a little about them in the rate, rate of mutation, but we've got one. Uh, coming in now, it's about, uh, you know, we think it's pretty, we think it's pretty kind of at the 10% level out in California, maybe 14, 15% level in California. Uh, and that's the B117 variant. We think our, uh, uh, and right now, uh, the, the Brits are indicating that real world analysis uh, is, is showing that uh, there's a 98% reduction in B117 variant uh, transmission, I'm sorry, and in and, 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 and disease level, and about an 85, uh, using, using Pfizer. Uh, or Moderna, and there's an 85% reduction uh, using uh, using uh, uh, um, uh, the, the the AstraZeneca vaccine, which isn't quite as effective. Um, so um, we think that that first variant that we're going to have to fight, we don't have uh, as we, we think the vaccines are going to control it. Uh, and that means my numbers are off. As you know, I tried to predict every uh, uh, kind of in three month intervals, uh, how many people are going to pass away from COVID. And I was predicting that the B117 virus w might escape the vaccine. And if they did, there would be 50,000 extra deaths. I now have to take those away because uh, I was wrong. And we're going to be at about 550,000 deaths, sadly, at the end, and, uh, at the end of April. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, that, 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 uh, now we have found uh, some some new variants from South Africa, as you know, and also uh, from South America, that uh, are 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 starting to escape slightly uh, the vaccine. And if those those uh, if those mutations start to stack on top of each other slowly but surely, they're going to escape more and more and more of the antibody circulation uh, of, uh, of of the vaccine. We're not sure about long term T cell immunity, and that's a big factor. A lot of uh, epidemiologists are saying, well, on the one hand, the antibody slippage you got, but uh, we think that in the long term, we're going to have a cellular immunity level that's going to cause continued suppression of even these variants. So there's some argumentation right now in the epidemiological community, uh, but but right now um, we have to watch this very carefully. And, that, and as I said, everyone who's manu who is manufacturing a virus today is trying to get a, vac a vaccine variant. Uh, so they call um, a, 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 a type of vaccine that's actually good against the, the variants. So you're gonna start to see different kinds of vaccines that are gonna start to attack different kinds of variants out in the marketplace, probably in September. So here's what you have to monitor. He, and so the, the vaccine, the strategy right there is going to have to, if you've got a lot of mutation, a lot of escape, you're going to have to go to the flu type environment, right? Every year you're going to have to get a new vaccine that's, that every year is developed brand new, has different efficacy rates at, at each time. If you've got something that you're, where, where you're just, where you are actually able to control the transmission spread, then you want to have an annual vaccine plus regular boosters. And if you can just dilute, then basically you want to go to a childhood universal vaccine plus boosters. So those are the different vaccines strategies, those are the different things you're monitoring. Notice what you're monitoring here, right? You're monitoring COVID prevalence, community vaccination levels, community spread levels, vulnerability levels, treatment medication levels, reinfection rates, neutralizing antibodies, genetic coding. We don't do that today. We're not nearly enough. Right now, our antigen level, our antigen testing is down 30% since Christmas. Hmm. Right? We're, hmm. we're doing 1.5 million tests. In fact, the average American has had one COVID test last year. 
one. That would be me. I had one. So you had one. How about yourself, Matt? You had one? I had two. You had two. Oh, you're, yeah, one, you're above one, average. I was going to say one before each surgery. So. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> that's why. So that's, that's why. Totally reasonable. And I also had one. So we're sort of average. That's the average rate of testing in the United States. One, and we and we've killed five hundred thousand people. That that you know, if you think about how much other testing we do for strep throat, for pneumonia, for you know, for my, you know, for just generally, we're way below where we need to be. Right? Genetic coding. We're doing seventy five hundred genetic tests a day. We need to do ten times that, twenty times, probably twenty times that, in order to just to get mm. to understand what's going on at, at at the at, at the variant level. We have no idea. We're flying completely blind here, and it's really frustrating. And the problem is that these components of efficacy we have to know a lot more about because they vary at different rates just because you're, you're you're causing a disease pathology to reduce doesn't mean necessarily that reinfection prevention or transmission spread is reducing at the same rate so you actually have to monitor this pretty carefully to understand overall effectiveness of the vaccine well we've also had problems with people complying with contact tracing right they just oh. refusing you, and you bring me to the next uh, the, the next slide uh, with that. Almost uh, as if we planned it. Yes. Well, yeah. Almost. I, I want to just. Unrehearsed. Totally unrehearsed. <laughs> <laughs> Believe me, you can usually tell the show is completely unrehearsed. I'm just... <laughs> so what's interesting here is that if, if we have too much of a gene pool. Um, and you start to apply, and they've got lots of virus out there, right? And you start to apply a vaccine, you can start to select for a superbug pretty quickly. Mm. And that's, that, that's worrisome. Right. That's what people are worried about. On the other hand, if you're able to actually control transmission spread, you can reduce the gene pool and reduce the amount of variant. So these are the two conflicting things we've got about the vaccines we start to introduce. At any, at any rate, that's this slide. And then Matt brought up the idea of contact tracing. And um, it turns out that we don't know. So what? what so what happened on on Friday? I got my phone. My phone was ringing off the. You know, uh, <laughs> one of my one of my colleagues at Johns Hopkins, uh, Mar Mar Marty Ma uh, Macquarie, uh said, "Great news: herd immunity in April." <laughs> and I read this. I, yeah, I heard that. I, I heard that this morning. This opinion piece, yeah. and I went, oh, "I think he was smoking something." Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And so I looked at all the, I said, how is this possible? And then, so then I called up his boss. I, I, and it's not actually his boss, but it's it in the same department, basically in the same, in the same medical school. I said, how did Marty get to this? And he said, I don't know. You know, and then, quote, and then he goes, the, 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 this other friend of mine goes on TV and, uh, on Sunday and says, COVID is not going to be controlled in our lifetime. So we got two people at the same medical school, one saying, April, everything's going to be great. And the other one says, not in our lifetime. And what is going on, right? <laughs> <laughs> and the answer is we don't have enough data. And whenever you don't have enough data, you fill it in with models and you have, make certain assumptions for the models, right? And I do a lot of modeling. And so basically this is the model that we use. We look at how much susceptible population you got. You use, then you, under, you sort of have, a, and, and then if you get fancy, you can start to worry about how much exposure you got, but you certainly want to have levels of infection and then how much it resolves, right? And those things basically say, if you have this much susceptibility and you have this much infection, you're going to have this much death or this much life left. And that's a very simple, what they call SIR model. And sometimes you throw an exposure. Now, the problem is on the susceptibility, Marty uh, uh, didn't, uh, said that he thought that no one, after you get vaccinated, no one's going to be susceptible anymore. Whereas mm -hmm. the other, my other colleague thought, no, that's not necessarily true. We could have quite a bit of susceptibility even after one's vaccinated. We're not really sure about that. Then Marty said, uh, and uh, and he all, and then he said uh, he also said that um, if you if we we measured one person who definitely has a case of COVID, that means six point five people we've missed. Hmm. Well, hmm. most experts are saying it's more like maybe we've missed twenty percent. <laughs> so, you know, so Marty's way out there, right on the, on the on the sort of level of immunity, and then you, you look, the exposure. We actually don't know what the prevalence level of the virus is. It really depends a lot. If you're in, if you're in Southern California, living in 10%, 20% positivity rates uh, versus you know uh, upper uh, the Upper Peninsula and certain areas where we've got you know not a very low prevalence, that makes a big difference to the kind of model you, you create. Then on the infection rate, we actually don't know, believe it or not, what the viral transmission rates are. We don't really know R zero what they call R0, this is really such an important number, right? We don't really know it exactly. We think it's about 2.3, but it could be 2.7. And it varies because as we, as we put on masks, as we put on, as we start to distance, it goes down because it can't find people as, as easily. So we actually, our behaviors influence 
R0. We don't know what the attacks rates are. We're trying to find that out. And we don't know about super spreader events very well. And those are the things that really define whether you're going to get infected or not. Then we don't really know what the fatality rates are. We know how many people are dying, but we don't know how many people were infected because we're not testing enough. So we don't understand what they call the IFR. And there's so there. many asymptomatic people. If you're not testing enough, right, you're not going to find them all. Yeah, so, we know the yeah. numerator pretty well. We, that, that person died of COVID, that person didn't die. Of, but we have no idea what the denominator is. <laughs> so mm. we're, you know, it could be, could be 40%. It could be, you know, 30 times more than that. We, we have, and then we don't really know the disease course yet because we haven't studied this long enough. And so what happened is, Basically, Marty said, you know, susceptible people, vaccinated, everything's going to be fine. We know the infection rates are going to go down to nothing. And we know the resolution is going to be great because we're, 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 we're a great medical school. And we're going to cure everything. Whereas my other <laughs> colleague was saying, we have no idea what any other factors are. And furthermore, we, we have lots of people with long haul effects. And, and people haven't really thought through these variants very effectively. So that's why I get so much that's why there's so much sort of up in the air. And part of it is we're trying to control too much, right? We're trying to say for the whole United States, it's gonna look like this. And the truth is it's gonna go community by community because herd immunity really matters. And that's how we get into this bubble question, right? Can we take a look and control our bubble? So it doesn't really matter what the rest of the world is doing. As long as you know these factors in your bubble, then maybe we can get a sense of what the real number is for us personally. We couldn't, we can't figure it out for the United States. It's just too many, too many variables. Eventually we probably will get, if we start doing, you know, if we really understand our vaccination levels, we under, under do our serology testing and monitor that pretty carefully. We regularly do surveillance testing and then also do daily personal testing and contact tracing, which is what your point was, Matt, and infection rate. We can't figure out what, if you get the disease, whether, you know, the next person, the next person, the next person does it. There are countries that do that very well. And so we think we have a little bit of a knowledge about what's going on, for example, in Taiwan and Korea. We have no idea what it is in the United States. But again, we don't do any antigen testing on the fatality rates. So we don't know the denominator. And so those are the things that we're missing. Now, if we start to test more and have more infrastructure in place, we'll be able to know that and be able to really control this virus. Very, you know, you'll be able to actually say what your level of risk is at any given time. But today we can't. So we try to let's try to reduce that to our own bubble. Before I do that, I wanted to show you uh, a couple of things. Oh, geez, you know what? We may not get to the bubble today. I was going to say, we're only, we're at about five minutes left here. For well, a, actually, so. Dave uh, said we can have an extra 10 minutes because we have Fred on. And, uh, oh, oh, okay. So we got well, Maybe we can get through. Okay. I don't know. We I might wanted... be able to. Yes, we can go to 310. So. Oh, my goodness. So I want to show you this. So the first big thing is, for goodness sakes, but if we don't sure, well, if we're not sure about transmission rates for the vaccine, we sure know more, a lot about transmission rates with a mask. And so, um, here is what things look like, right? If you've got a cotton mask, you and you're and you are, and I've shown you this before, right? If you're if you if you're with someone who has the disease and you're with them for more than 15 minutes and they're more and they're closer than six feet away, you are at risk. How big a risk? There's a possibility of transmission attack rate is about 70 percent with a regular cotton mask. Mm -hmm. If you're N95 mask, goes way down, 0.1 percent, because the N95 mask is that much better. Possibility of transmission in the other direction, if, if that person, if that sick person's wearing a mask and you are well and not wearing a mask, suddenly goes down to 5%. Hmm. Overall, that means the average efficacy of a mask is about 40, 40%, right? Uh, 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 75 divided by two. And then we've got the tra transmission of both of you guys wearing a mask, very low, 1.5%. Both of you wearing an N95 mask, very, very low. So the question is, how so, so, so then we started looking more closely at these masks. So, so we don't have enough PPE in the United States right now. We're severely constrained. We probably need about 70 times more PPE than we actually have. And the answer is that there are some things you can do. And you can see that they recommend either double masking, this is a recent, recent CDC uh, work, or not in tucked. If you not, in, you can see that basically if you double, if you, if you not in tuck, and I'll show you that in a second, you move from about a 42% level of efficacy to a 65% level of efficacy. So because this is so important, I want to show you quickly how you do that. You fold your mask in half, okay? And then you tie as close as you can your loop, right? Like that. And you, so you tie it up and you pull it close to the, to the, to as close to the mask as you can, right? Can you see me okay? There it is. 
Now I've got that knot. So now let's put this on, right? Here is, always wash your hands before you put on your mask. Here is the knotted side. And what you do is you push that in and you tuck this back in, right? Here's the on, on, on side. So here's that side, right? And you've got, and if you tuck it in properly, which I haven't done, prop, tuck it in properly. See, there, oh, I didn't tuck it in properly. Hold everything. There we are. Now I've tucked it in. You see how, how, how tight that is against my face, how much tighter that is? Here's that side. It's all coming out that. See how, how, I can, how I can inhale and it comes in? So you do it on both sides, obviously, not just one. I just want to show you the difference. Here you got a lot of, lot of gap. Here, no gap. Can't get my finger in. That's the difference. That's 64% effective. That's 45% effective. Hmm. Now, I know, N, I know N95 masks are hard to come by. What do you think of the KN95 masks, which seem to be everywhere? You can get those the all Chinese over. Chinese knockoff, yes. Yeah, yeah, Chinese knockoff. As long as they're NIOSH approved or they're Chinese approved, they're very good. Don't get a don't get a fake one. The fake ones are up on uh, up on the uh, CDC website. Look, I'll go under masks and look under uh, fake, and you can see exactly what which which numbers are that are fake. The the, the NIOSH approved masks will say NIOSH approved. It'll say FDA approved. Each of them will have a number, a registration number. That number will be stamped, uh, not just here, but it'll be also uh, on the loops. This is not N95 because uh, any N95s only go behind the ear are not true N95 masks. They actually come. They should go behind your neck. Here and here, you know, behind your head, behind your neck. So that's a mince red flag. Loop, ear loops, not not a real N95 mask. But a KN95 mask, if it's a true Chinese mask, actually goes through slightly more rigorous procedures than we do in the United States. They only have an 8% leakage out the sides. The United States has 11 to 12% leakage out the side. So if they're truly NIOSH approved, truly KN95, absolutely, uh, go for it. Uh, that, that's most important is that you know this is just uh, is, is 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 woven fabric. Uh, and your woven fabrics tend to allow uh, the molecules to travel through pretty easily. If you can get triple triple uh, protection, that's better. If you if you are double masking, that's even better. Uh, and if you can uh, use a surgical mask, that causes that, that that stops the molecule static electricity. So imagine you take your socks out of the dryer, and you know how they stick together with stuff. That's how surgical masks stop. You need to have something go over your surgical mask uh, because they're a little bit loose, too loose for you every day. Uh, and the 95 mask use, uh, works with the intercalation. So actually it's a pressed, fa fa pressed fabric, not, not a woven fabric, that actually causes the mo molecules to have to go through so, so many little channels that it stops the molecule. And that's I, I've seen the uh, Biden administration folks wearing double masks. So they have a white mask underneath, and then they typically have a black mask over that. Well, you can see you're talking about, you know, with a single mask, uh, no mask, mask, double mask, you can get a sense of that, of, of how, just how much more effective you're talking about the accumulative exposure. What they're finding is that it's not just about, and here's the double mask, you can see that on, the, on, on B, that's the double mask effect. Mm -hmm. and, and you can see that that, that is, you know, it's, it's much more than just a, uh, it's much more effective than just a single, what you, what you'd think. It's not just twice as effective, it's, a, it's actually uh, about eight times more effective in overall uh, cumulative exposure. And what, that's what it turns out. It turns out that it, what is important and why your bubble is going to be important is because cumulative uh, exposure gets to be important. Now, the other mm -hmm. big way we have to control this, uh, uh, to control your bubble, uh, is uh, and how much exposure you're getting, is, uh, is through uh, testing. And uh, this is basically the strategy that people are starting to use for testing. They're starting to worry about the kind of exposure you're coming to. So if you're going through borders a lot, and you're traveling an awful lot, you want to have to, you're, you're going to have to, uh, especially over long distances from community to community that aren't, that aren't necessarily uh, linked together, except by you, you want to have to, you're, you're going to have to uh, um, uh, really uh, get an awful lot of screening. You'll have to have, to have that screening in advance. And then when upon arrival, and then after you're there twice. So basically four levels of screening, four, four days before you leave at the airport, a day, uh, four days after you arrive, and then again, five or 10 days after you arrive and the most strict communities, which will be Taiwan the North, and the Northern Asian countries, as well as parts of Europe. If you, on the other hand, don't travel that much, but are 
are in semi-closed communities. These are like your workplaces, right? Um, where you're with people who are, you know, in your community generally uh, or in schools and you're coming together regularly. Um, you want to, you want to actually, uh, instead of, you know, getting a, 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 getting a test before, during, and after, uh, you want to have tests every day. Uh, it turns out you don't have to do tests every day. The models indicate that you have to do tests every two days, every three days, excuse me. If you do a test every three days, your level of risk is pretty low. Once you go to a week and you see people regularly and you're in a place of over a thousand workers, for example, you've got a great chance of really causing a, uh, creating a spread. Uh, if you get over you know, 5,000 people and you're going to two weeks, it's almost, it's almost the same as, it, as, as not testing at all. So, you know, you're, uh, th th those models are really starting to come together now. We're starting to see really have to test pretty regularly. If you're constantly going to wor a workplace, you'll want to have testing pretty regularly. And finally, there's the random piece, right? And here, it's, it's sort of, I want to go to the football game. What do I do if I want to go to the football game? <laughs> you know, those are the big, <laughs> that seems to keep we all want to, or dying to go watch, right? Uh, or I want to go to the bar. Uh, and in this case, you, you, want to, um, you want to combat the super spreader chance, right? And so here, you, you know, uh, you, where you, you want, really want to do pre-testing. So before you go to the event, you want to test yourself, make sure that you're good, show them your green pass, hey, I'm tested, or hey, I'm vaccinated, and then you can go in. So those are the things that you can start to do and what people are starting to worry about. Um, and then you want to think about your levels of control, your PPE and your mixing. And um, they're different activity. Oh, uh, and so here's what the football uh, uh, groups, uh, the NFL teams found out. They found out that cumulative uh, impact of COVID was a big factor. They found out that you know six feet often wasn't enough distance. And they found out that 15 minutes often was way too long a period of time uh, because they would get enough stuff in you. The first, uh, the first interaction of six feet and 15 minutes, then they go and talk to the coach, another, another 15 minutes and six feet. Then they go talk to their friends and then they go shower and they'd have you know, five exposures of six feet and 15 minutes plus. And they found out eh, it doesn't work because those six, those six exposures in the course of less than maybe five or five or six hours were enough to get them over the threshold and give them COVID. Hmm. And so what the football teams did is they decided to do something else. They decided <clears throat> to look at four factors. They said distance matters, six feet, time matters, 15 minutes, mask use matters. If one person wasn't wearing a mask, another person was. And then the ventilation and airflow, if you were in a really closed up space um, and they would look, and they'd ask the players to, to say, you know, were you, uh, did, did, were all these factors in line or was one of them missing? So was one of them, time, one of the times you saw someone without a mask or was one of the time you didn't have enough ventilation? It turns out that as soon as two of these factors, any two of these factors were broken, they, they immediately isolated the players. Hmm. So if you're seeing someone for more than six feet and more than, uh, more, more than 15 minutes, twice or you didn't have mask use and you had an unventilated area um, once, <laughs> uh, that, that was enough to put you over and they would isolate you. And they, you know, all of a sudden, um, they, they stopped all the spread. Hmm. So that's the sort of thing you want to think about when you're creating your own bubble, right? Here are the distance, here are the factors. Think about whether you're violating any of those factors. If, the, if, if any two are bro broken, then your bubble is going to pop. Now, the other thing you want to worry about, and football players only worried about practice, but it turns out that there are other levels of risk you got to think about. So if you're going to a bar regularly and you still have three of the four factors, man, you are really super high risk versus, you know, just going to the mall or, or getting to the restaurant or pumping gas or, you know, the, so there's a, you kind of kind of have to, because football players are doing just one thing, <laughs> working out uh, and, and, and playing football, they were able to sort of say, this is what I'm doing. But for you, for your bubble, you're going to have to think a little bit about how much risk you're doing with all these different activities and really limit those activities and understand it and kind of modify what your behavior is based on what you're doing as well as your susceptibility uh, based on the football factors. So with that, we're going to start to, you know, there, right now you can sort of just think about it in your own mind, but eventually we're going to get a um, you know, better, better understanding of this. So we'll probably be able to track some of this for you and with you, with your phone uh, and with your, with, with, with your smartphone over time. If COVID becomes something that's something we have to worry about for an awful long time, we'll definitely get to this. If we're able to, you know, if, if Marty's right, we're able to get to her immunity by April, which I 
I'm not sure. I think he's a little over optimistic. Yeah, I think that's a little optimistic. Yeah. <laughs> then we won't have to we won't have to worry about this. But but my sense is we're going to have to worry at least about some of this. And so you're going to have to sort of wonder about who's in my bubble, who am I seeing regularly, what clubs, what what's what are their what are their uh, what are their what habits. Are their, yeah. habits right well, who you know who gets into the who gets into it and you can see you get there are different kind of levels of risk right um where uh, some bubbles have a whole outbreak and you got to isolate the whole bubble and that's not good you don't want to visit that bubble and this this and then of course you got that one guy who, who was part of both bubbles and he broke he popped the other bubble because now you have to isolate the other bubble right because you said oh my gosh my, my friend june who i go bingo bingo playing with also is at the bar so that now pop the bar bubble and that then hits a question mark about you know your immediate circle of friends but you can all get tested you could all have a vaccine this so you can all have different levels of bubble protection and you can start to manage your bubbles based on that level of protection. Uh, now, now, Dave's Dave's bubble is that whiskey in the jar uh, in <laughs> him tremic. Uh, so I mean, you're I, not I, inaccurate. <laughs> okay, well, I, I was, you know, uh, he's not a bubble burster though. So, uh, oh, it's it's about the same four people there all the time. It's yeah. And you know, oh, okay. and you can see some of the times you have to worry about whether you got a super spreader in, in, in your bubble, and soon soon we'll be able to kind of detect uh, that. You'll have to worry about in your bubble whether someone's who's super sensitive, super vulnerable, whether they're they, you know they they have uh, 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 you know a, a high level of risk or uh, they are immunosuppressed because they're on they have they're cancer chemotherapy. You have to manage that bubble a little bit more carefully. You'll have to kind of think about what how long how often you get tested and whether you have uh, testing that's pretty regular and. Some people are tested all the time, like the healthcare workers, and I'm pretty comfortable in those bubbles. But when I move to, you know, when I move to uh, uh, other events uh, where everyone isn't tested, then I worry quite a bit. Uh, and then how? And then you have to kind of think about the fit football factors within each of those bubbles. How long was I there? Was there were people masking up? Was there distance? Uh, was there distance when we were uh, together? Um, and, and was the ventilation good? Uh, so especially if you're working, I, I, I tend to I only tend to meet people outside. I always t I always wear a mask when I meet people. Uh, and I'm always more than six feet away. Um, uh, sometimes I sometimes I violate the time, um, and that I got you know you got to kind of watch that uh, uh, periodically. So that's we're, that. We're going to have to leave it at that yeah, bubble. I've got one more. Shot okay, shot one, one more point. Go ahead. And then and then slowly, what you do is you start to add up all the bubbles, and you'll be able to start to manage this at a at a more national level and that's what that's what the uk is already at there are they already realized now they're doing this they're doing this after the fact so they figured out that remember they had this little bubble in china and the, and the uk said oh we've got this chinese problem so we're going to stop all the chinese from coming into the country meanwhile what was really happening is they stopped the chinese bubble they stopped the, the wuhan variant completely what they didn't realize is that they had a lot of their people go to venice uh, and you can see that little blue, that little blue thing, and that uh -huh. Italian piece was actually what they should have stopped. They didn't know, right? And so they, they should have stopped. Oh, yeah, North, Northern piece. Italy had it really bad at the beginning, right? That's so, just it, right? So they went to yeah. Venice. They got as people brought it back, and then then they said, you know, it's just we're still pretty cold up here in England, still a little too rainy. And they all went to Spain, and you can see the Spanish peak coming through. And they should have actually stopped Spain, France, and Italy, not. China. Well, they probably should have stopped China too, but they, but now we start to understand the variants. We can start to say, you know, we're worried about people who are traveling back and forth to Spain. And you can see this is the B117 virus. They actually were able to tell Spain, Italy, the UAE, all these different flight connections in advance. Hey, you know, we've got a bad variant. People were on your plane. People who had the variant have been, you know, tested now, uh, and they they were on your plane. They were in your country. They were there for a while. Uh, be, you know, uh, and and then Spain can start to say, let's start to monitor that, so you can get ahead of the virus. That's the idea. Traditional four-year okay. students love Lawrence Technological University's thriving campus life, but LTU has always met non-traditional students' needs too. Lawrence Tech offers over 100 degree and certificate programs that can get adult students started or back on track. And most of our classes are conveniently offered evenings at our beautiful Southfield campus or online so you can balance your social, family, and work life even while you power up your career. Lawrence Tech, where blue devils dare.